Well, good evening. Wonderful to see you all again. So our, our next speaker um, is also an award-winning author. <laughs> I, I first met John uh, in 1988. We were young pups. We were uh, at a conference. We were the youngest speakers on a docket of luminaries. And um, when the conference ended, a woman who had been in a church I was in came up to me. She said, good job, Jim. I said, oh, thank you, thank you. A little nervous. She said, that Ortberg. <laughs> wow. She said, I, I went to get a tape of his talk. Remember when we had cassette tapes of talks? I went to get a cassette tape of his talk. They were all gone. But I got one of yours. They had a lot of them. <laughs> so, thus began the friendship. <laughs> well, I don't think he needs much of an introduction, but he's been in ministry over 40 years teaches in formation, his contribution to the formation movement uh, has been significant, and his books, his teaching, um, it's phenomenal. But the thing I love the most about John is his heart, how much his heart beats for Jesus, and he wants to live as an apprentice of Jesus, and I'm so grateful to have him with us. Let's give a nice apprentice welcome, John Ortberg. Man, it's wonderful to be here. I have never lived in Kansas, but this feels a lot like coming home. Um, I think there's something about being together with people where there's a set of common questions and common concerns and wondering what makes human beings the way they are and where does God fit in and where does faith fit in and how do people really change and what does Jesus have to say to us? And those are the questions that really matter. And when you're with other people, that kind of reminds you, yep, that's what really counts. That's what really matters. It's a very encouraging thing. So I was very, very honored and grateful when you, Jim, asked me if I would come here. And uh, being together with you is just a huge gift. Thank you. And I do want to talk about what matters most. I think sometimes when you wonder what do people care most about? The best way to find out is not so much to ask them directly, it's to look at what makes them go ballistic when it gets threatened. Um, I live in Northern California and I'm not a car guy, but in that part of the country there's a lot of people that love their cars. And I was driving my car, old 2009 Honda Accord, not long ago, and uh, it was in a parking area, and the parking is real congested. You ever notice how parking spaces keep getting smaller, but the vehicles keep getting bigger? And I was backing out, and I heard this little metallic sound. And it wasn't real loud, but it was distinct. And so I had to look. I'm a pastor, and I got out, and I looked. And on the other car next to mine, there was a scratch. It wasn't a dent. It wasn't a ding. It was almost decorative but it was a scratch. And, and the worst part was that it wasn't an old beat up car like mine, it was a brand new car, a brand new Italian car. Its name rhymes with Torari. <laughs> and so I wrote my name and my real phone number and left it on the windshield. And later that day I got a call from the owner of that car and he said, Appreciate your letting me know what happened and giving me your contact information. I just need you to know that car is like my baby. I have to have it in mint condition. I said, okay, I understand. Called me back the next day. He said, just wanted to let you know. I took it into the shop, and uh, they cannot buff the scratch out. They're going to have to replace the whole panel. <laughs> okay, I understand. Called me back the next day. Uh, they let me know that they don't have the panel here. They're going to have to send away to Italy for it. Okay, I understand. It's a true story. Coming back one more time the next day, he said, uh, this whole thing has bothered me so much, I'm going to get a new car. You don't owe me anything at all. <laughs> and 
And I said, well, if you're not going to use the old car anymore, uh, Dallas would talk a lot about treasuring and what do you treasure, and we can treasure the oddest things, and a big, big part of what it means to be a human being is that we are people who treasure. And the scriptures talk about an object of such profound, immense worth that it's almost beyond description, but it's not talked about much, let alone treasured in our day, it's what I want to talk about in these moments. Moses, in his final words to his people, gave, him, gave them this command. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 4. Only be careful and guard your souls carefully. And in, in the New Testament, we're told it's actually the job of people who do pastoral ministry to care for souls. The writer of Hebrews puts it like this. Have confidence in your leaders. Be responsive to their counsel. They keep watch over your souls as people who must give account. Follow them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. That's often just nowadays translated, they keep watch over you, but that word, that Greek word, psuche, the uh, Hebrew word, nephesh, the word soul. In fact, one title for pastor is the word curate, which comes from an ancient expression for the cure of souls, that our souls are somehow sick and need to be cured. But of all the statements about it, the deepest, the most remarkable, of course, comes from Jesus, who said, this is in the Gospel of Mark, for what good is it for you to gain the whole world, yet lose your soul? Or what can you give in exchange for your soul? In other words, you have a soul, whatever that is, we'll get to that, and the soul can be lost whatever it means to have a lost soul, and we'll get to that. And if that happens, you could place the entire world, the whole cosmos, all the wealth that you could imagine on one side of a set of scales, and then your soul on the other side, a single soul, and it's no contest. The value is here. So I want to talk for a bit about the nature of the soul, how it fits into our personhood, why it is that it is so valuable, what it means to care for souls, to cure for souls for you and me. I'll just note up front, I am very deeply indebted as I talk through this to the work of Beyonce. No, it's actually Dallas Willard. I just get tired of quoting Dallas all the time. Always Dallas, Dallas, Dallas. So give Beyonce a little credit. I don't know. Um, uh, I am, like many of us are, deeply indebted to Dallas uh, so the, and, and uh, immersed enough in his thoughts that it's very hard for me to think about the kind of topics that we'll talk about this evening without uh, quoting thinking thoughts that I have learned and heard from him. So uh, I'm deeply indebted. Pretty much anything that comes out of the talk that is of much substance will have come from the wisdom of Jesus and spiritual writers and thinkers. And then for me, Dallas was just a helpful person in putting that together. Um, so uh, in particular, his book, Renovation of the Heart, is something that you can read about to follow along more. I'm going to do a little diagram right now to think about the parts of the person. I know it's a large room. You may not be able to see it, but uh, it helps me even just to draw out these circles that Dallas did and to think about them. The nature of personhood is uh, an endlessly fascinating topic. I used to find when I would read the Bible and there would be talks about the old man and new man and the flesh and the heart and the conscience, it was a little hard to put all that together. How do those pieces fit? And then, of course, there's the field of psychology and there's enormous differences. There's not really any great clarity in that whole field about what might be called the anatomy of the person, the parts of a person. Big disagreements in that field about just the nature of personhood and whether or not spiritual reality exists. So uh, what was helpful to me was to hear and to read Dallas talk about persons in terms of their function. And so this is really the essential parts of a person from a functional perspective. What are the ingredients that you need to make up a person? 
And at the very center, at the core of you, Dallas would say, and he would say this is not original with him, but it goes way back to ancient writers, you have a will. You have the ability to say yes or no. You are able to choose. This is what gives dignity to persons. Kant said dignity is the worth that makes a person irreplaceable at any price. This is what enables you to bring good into existence and why we marvel at the entry of every human being into this world. When our first child was born, just a few seconds after her body came out into this world, Nancy handed her to me, and I held her, and I had this experience that I had not anticipated. It was like in a moment I could picture the entire arc of her existence of her life in a flash and it was overwhelming to me and I said to Nancy I can't believe this little body that I'm holding right now is really going to grow up and this little skin that is so pink and smooth and perfect is going to get wrinkled and mottled and this hair Laura was born with one strip of red hair down the middle of her head like a little mohawk. This red hair one day is going to turn gray, and then it will turn white, and then we'll grow old, and we will die, and then she will grow old, and she will die, this little baby that I'm holding. And Nancy said, let me hold her. You're creeping her out. <laughs> but... What it is that makes a person so remarkable, so amazing, of such wonder, what makes us uh, accountable to God, moral agents, which is at the essence of personhood, is that we have this capacity, that we have will. Two other words that are used in the ancient world, prominently in the Bible, that Dallas would say refer to essentially this same function with a little different nuance. Uh, one is the word heart. That's a picture of a heart. <laughs> you won't be able to tell what it is. And then the other one is the word spirit. And of course, all words have ranges of meanings, and they can vary according to context and so. But Dallas would say, in the biblical world, in the ancient world, uh, the general understanding was at the core of a person is this capacity to say yes or no. When we use the word spirit, uh, we emphasize the fact that it's a form of energy or power, but it's not physical power. It's not magnetism. It's not electricity. It's personal power. And then when we use the term heart, we're emphasizing the fact that it's right in the core of your being. It's the center of who you are. Guard your heart. Okay, so that's the will. You have one of those. It makes you unlike anybody else. It's what gives you your little kingdom. It's why we get into so much trouble, because we violate one another's kingdoms. Um, I will, sometimes when we go to bed, say to my wife, Nancy, I command you to turn that light off. And she'll leave the light on all night long, rather than give me the satisfaction of thinking that my will is going to override her will. So that's at the core. Then at the next layer out of you is your mind. And in the ancient world, generally, mind referred to both thoughts and feelings. That's our ability um, to direct consciousness. And that's going on so rapidly, we can hardly even keep track of it. Almost every thought has at least a little feeling attached to it. Virtually every feeling, if it's not just a sheer physical sensation, has some kind of thought attached to it. And that stream is running all the time, and that stream is basically your life. If we talk about an angry person or a joyful person or a uh, sad person, we're talking about the quality of their mind. My, um, I, I looked at my wallet a while ago for my credit card, and it was gone, and then I remembered my son had it, and I was a little perturbed. This is the way the mind works so quickly. So I texted him, do you have my credit card? No terms of endearment, nothing. Just a little leakage of, I'm not real thrilled about this. And then, all this is in my mind, I remembered the reason he had it was I had loaned it to him because I asked him to do an errand for me. And he had not had time to run that errand yet. So when he wrote back, yes, I have it, I texted him back, uh, tell it that I miss it. <laughs> Just because I wanted to soften in my mind the message that I was sending to him. Now, if our lives are working right, uh, our wills will give direction to our body. And our wills, 
we will not have conflicted choices within our will. Remember Dallas wrote in The Spirit of the Disciplines that a prominent magazine in Los Angeles at the time was The Good Life. Its two most popular ads were for fine dining and weight reduction, which is a little hard to balance both of those things. And that's the problem with our will is we we want simultaneously conflicting impossible things. And then um, with our minds, if our minds are working right, we will think thoughts that are true and we will desire things that are noble. Then the next layer out is your body. Uh, Your body is that little power pack. That's where your kingdom begins. Um, Our bodies uh, are mostly run by habit. That's a real good thing. Our bodies are largely driven by appetite. We have lots and lots of appetites. Um, But we have problems managing our bodies. And one time when Jesus went off to pray, a lot of you will know this story, his disciples were with him and they could not stay awake. Some of us are having that problem right about now. And Jesus' comment was, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And that's one of the great problems with our bodies. Our bodies are meant to serve our wills and our minds, but often it gets the other way around. Habits eat willpower for breakfast. And then the next layer out is the social dimension of who you are, your relationships. This grounds my identity. I will forever be the son of John and Kathy Ortberg, and I'm the husband of Nancy and the father. And so this is so deeply embedded in our bodies. Daniel Siegel, a lot of you will know, uh, uh, is, is the uh, kind of guru of what he calls interpersonal neurobiology, that what other people say to us when our parents speak into our bodies when we're little actually changes our synapses and gets wired into us. We carry people around inside in a virtually literal and physical way. We are social beings. We cannot live without it. Robert Putnam from Harvard says, if you make no other changes in the next year but join a small group, you cut your odds of dying in half. So at my old church, our small group motto was join a group or die. (laughs) Putnam says, Putnam says, Um, If you have terrible health habits, eat bad, don't exercise, sleep bad, but you're relationally connected, you are more likely to survive than if you have great health habits, jog, sleep, eat great, but are relationally isolated. That's how so... In other words, it is better to eat Twinkies with friends than to eat broccoli alone. Why some of you came here is just to hear that one right there. So then, then, here's the main deal. Then we come to that part of us, that reality of us that's beyond that one that is called the soul. I had the hardest time with this when Dallas would talk about it. Um, He would sometimes say it's kind of like a computer program that's going to run a business or something. And for about 10 years, I wrestled with trying to understand, what do you mean by this? One time we were at a conference and I would ask him questions. And uh, we were talking about the soul, and he was explaining it, and I still didn't understand it. And our dog had recently died, so I asked him kind of tongue-in-cheek, do dogs have souls? And Della said, of course. And then I asked him even more tongue-in-cheek, do cats have souls? Because I'm not a big cat guy. And Della said, yes. And then Della said, trees have souls. And I thought, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. And I knew Della well enough to know he was not a pantheist. He did not believe that trees are persons and that they have a conscience existence and so. so. So then he began to explain in a way that I could finally grasp it what the word soul meant in the ancient world and it's different. So I had to do some adjusting. You may agree, may disagree on this one. Uh, many folks in churches have what one writer calls the Looney Tunes theory of the soul. There's a Yale psychiatrist and Episcopal clergyman, Jeffrey Boyd, who fought for many years a one-man battle to bring the concept of soul back. He was one of the writers of the DSM, Diagnostic Statistic Manual, that the American Psychiatric Association uses to diagnose people. But he said when he would do surveys in churches, most people would think, anybody remember those old Looney Tune cartoons? 
when Daffy Duck gets shot and his body goes down to the earth and then this thin, wispy, vapory Daffy Duck rises up to the sky. And Boyd says, that's actually in churches. Lots of, we use the word soul a lot, but lots of people, if you push him, they picture it as being this thin, vapory, wispy part of you that lives on after you die. Dallas said, what happened in the ancient world was people would look at living beings. They would look at, say, a tree. And they would see it has multiple functions. It's got roots. It can take in nourishment. It can reproduce. It can grow leaves. It can photosynthesize. It can bear fruit. Many different functions, but it is one life. It's one being. So they call the capacity to integrate different functions into one life soul. It didn't mean that which lives on after you die or that which is going to walk around in some immaterial existence or any of the things that Dallas said kind of from Descartes on tend to be in people's mind. In the ancient world, including the biblical world, the capacity to integrate different functions into one single being, one single organism they would call soul. So I started looking, and it turns out it is true if you look at Uh, Augustine or at Aquinas, they will talk about the vegetative soul and the animal soul and then the rational or human soul. And obviously these Christians didn't think about, you know, trees as having personal conscious existences or so on. That was their understanding of soul. Uh, and, And this helps us understand so many Uh, text in scripture, for example, Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, all that is within me. Or when Jesus says, here's the essence of the law, love the Lord your God with all your soul and all your mind and all your heart and all your strengths, and then love your neighbor as yourself. If you want to think about what does it mean to be a person, what are the parts of the person, I I know of no explanation of it to match this one. And it's wisdom that is desperately needed, particularly the soul. The soul is the whole person. This is so true that soul often is used simply as a synonym for person. Even in our day, on an airplane or ship records, there will sometimes be the question, how many souls on board. Most people don't have any idea where that came from. Acts 27, 37, telling the story of Paul in a shipwreck. Altogether, there were 276 souls on board. So, uh, uh, as I understand it, again, not original with me at all, Dallas, lots of other folks, you can think about it uh, as makes sense to you. Your soul is what integrates your will, the choices that I'm making, with My mind, the thoughts that I'm thinking and the feelings and the desires that I have, my conscience and so, and then my body with all of my habits and my appetites and then my relationships with other people, the soul is what integrates all of these. And all of these are made to be in harmony so that my body will always do what it is that my will tells it to do, and so that my mind will always think thoughts that are true and desire desires that are harmonious with my conscience, so that I'm one whole. And that's part of why I will say, uh, like if I go into nature, it was good for my soul because my will wanted to be there, my mind and my body, everything was fully present there. We'll talk about a spirited athlete or a spirited horse. That's energy. We still have remnants of this, but we'll talk about a soulful artist. Dallas said, what is running your life at any given moment is your soul, not external circumstances or your thoughts or your intentions. This is where a lot of kind of self-help stuff that just says you can choose your attitude, you can choose joy. Nope, you can't. Habits eat willpower for breakfast. Not even your feelings, but your soul. The soul is that aspect of your whole being that correlates, integrates, and enlivens everything going on in the various dimensions of the self. It is the life center of human beings. You have a soul. strange how quiet it can get in a room, just that truth. 
Dallas used to talk about a single human soul as larger than the universe. It is so deep that there are many parts of it that I cannot seem to understand or directly control. And that, by the way, is part of why ancient writers in the Bible but other places would sometimes address the soul in the second person. Why are you so downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? You never see this where people are addressing the heart or addressing the mind, but they address the soul because it's so deep and so mysterious and so vast. Nancy and I got married in California. She's a California girl, but I wanted to bring joy to her soul, so I took her for our honeymoon to Wisconsin. <laughs> it did not bring joy to her soul, so I saved up for several decades, and for a big anniversary, we went to Australia and snorkeled on the Great Barrier Reef. It was amazing. One moment you're snorkeling at a few feet of water, you could literally stand up, and then you look over the edge, and it's bottomless. It's an abyss. Nancy is an adventuresome person. It actually scared her. She wanted to get back in the boat. I said, I've been saving for 20 years. You will not get in the boat. You will swim over the abyss. And uh, it did not help us, that conversation. <laughs> but the soul, to get back to the topic... The soul is as deep as eternity. In fact, one of the words the Bible uses to describe the place of a soul eternally without God is abusos, the abyss. When Job said, Job 7, 11, I will speak out of the bitterness of my soul. He was speaking from the depths of his being. And it is not a good thing for a human being to think they are a soulless being. Now, this notion of depth is part of why the Bible actually speaks a number of times of the soul of God. There are 20 passages in Scripture over them that speak not of human souls, but of God's soul. Now, again, if you have odd notions, different notions of the nature of the soul, that will seem either weird or at best metaphorical. But when God says, for example, I will put my dwelling place among you and my soul will not reject you. All that God is stands behind this promise. Jesus gets baptized. A voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him my soul is well pleased. And the idea here is that God is speaking from the deepest place of his being. Now, uh, this is the way that God designed this. It's a wonderful design, but the problem, of course, is sin. And that sin has gotten into the different parts of us. It's gotten into our will and into our mind and into our body and into our relationship. And sin always causes the disintegration of the person the destruction of the soul. I choose to harbor judgmental thoughts about you in my mind, but I distort my body, I twist my face into a smile to deceive you. So now my body and my mind are disintegrated. Dallas used to say one of the reasons we love little children so much is they have not yet learned to manage their face. And then we learn how to manage our face to be able to deceive other people so that what is happening inside me is not apparent from what is outside me, and we call that growing up. I have a proud heart. I have greedy hands. I have lustful thoughts. I am everlastingly obsessed with myself. My will is enslaved to my appetites. We call that addiction when the will is enslaved to the body. Uh, my desires are no longer congruent with my conscience. It's, that's why it's only possible to be a fully integrated person if what I will is the good. Because if I will anything else, my conscience still knows, and it will not be quiet. I want to have money, but I also want to have a reputation for being a generous person, so I want to hide the fact that I really want to have money. But then part of me knows that I'm hiding that, so I kind of despise myself because I know I'm not being real. And, and it just makes a mess. And then through denial, 
Now, deny, in denial, my will keeps my mind from having certain thoughts. Desire will do the same thing. If you're in the grip of desire, there are thoughts, there are people, there are conscience notions that will simply not come to conscience for you. This is a ruined soul. And this brings us back to Jesus when he says, what good does it do a person if they gain the whole world but lose that? I used to think what that meant was, it doesn't do you any good if you make a lot of money, have a lot of pleasure, a lot of great sex, if you end up going to hell. That is not what Jesus is saying. It's true, but it's not what he's saying. He is diagnosing precisely a specific human condition. When the will becomes splintered so that it wants mutually impossible things, and when it is no longer empowered so that instead of it being able to direct my body for my mouth to say what it ought to say and my hands to do what it ought to do, instead my will becomes enslaved to my body, and the good that I would do I cannot do, and the things that I would not do, those things I do, oh, wretched person that I am, and my mind is filled with destructive fantasies and false thoughts and, and desire narrows me down into this little obsessive cycle so that I no longer can freely think of whatever the good things would be for me to do. And then I use my body to deceive other people who are around me in our relation. That's a lost soul. You don't even have to believe in the Bible to this. Just look at the world. Howard Hughes, if you remember that name. Amy Winehouse. Me. You. That is a lost soul. And we need desperately to attend to the soul. We need a place for the cure and the healing of souls. We don't do that because our world has largely replaced the word soul with the word self. Self is the secular version. Psychology, as you know, comes from that psuche, psyche, the Greek New Testament word for soul. But it focuses on the self. Self carries a different meaning, connotation, than soul. Think of the difference between being selfish and soul-ish. The Journal of the American Medical Association found over the last 100 years or so, each generation is three times more likely to experience depression than the one that went before it. Big debates about why is that the case. Martin Seligman, kind of founder of the positive psychology movement, uh, maybe the preeminent psychologist of our day, his theory is that the reason that we are so much more prone to depression in our day is we have replaced church, faith, community. He is not a person of faith himself, but he says we have replaced church, faith, community, meaning with a unit that, can, a unit that cannot bear meaning, the self. And he actually named this narcissistic me first self after one of the 50 states. Anybody want to guess which state? California, thank you. <laughs> not the Kansas state. If you're empty, you need to fulfill yourself. If you're stressed, you need to take care of yourself. If you're on a job interview, you must believe yourself. At the tattoo parlor, express yourself. Somebody criticize you, love yourself. Not get in your own way, stand up for yourself. What should you do on a date? Be yourself. What if yourself was a train wreck? <laughs> and the word soul reminds us we were not made for ourself. The soul always exists before God. There is this depth to the soul. That's why the two words are not interchangeable. Imaginally singing, it is well with myself. <laughs> or then sings myself, my Savior God to thee. Or Jesus, lover of myself. This is a, a sad loss. Even biblical translations reflect this. The King James Bible translates uses the word soul 533 times. The New King James uses soul 369 times. The New International Version uses it 136 times. The Living Bible uses it 88 times. Now, I think mostly that's because the word soul in our day seems to be non-scientific. And we don't have time to get into that. But uh, science has not shown that there is no such thing as the soul. You are not your brain. An idea is not the same thing as a neuron firing. There is nothing in the world of science or neurology that has demonstrated that spiritual reality or particularly the soul does not exist. When we see other people 
and, and remember that they have souls, we look at them differently. Andy Crouch has a wonderful passage in his new book where he talks about one time he was at a hair airport and he walked around for an hour and his discipline was everybody he looked at, he would just say, image bearer, image bearer, image bearer. And I'll do that sometimes. And when I do, I look differently at people. The soul requires satisfaction. Uh, uh, Isaiah 55, why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight, delight in the richest affair. There's an interesting phrase that's used a few times in the Psalms where the psalmist says, deliver my precious nefesh, that is soul, from the power of the dogs. Or Psalm 35, 17, rescue me from my enemies, my precious nefesh soul from those, these lions. Does the phrase my precious ring any bells with anybody? <laughs> There's a picture, I think, coming up. Um, you may know the name of the character Gollum in The Lord of the Rings actually comes from a Hebrew word. It's used one time in the Old Testament, Psalm 139, to describe, uh, it's used there for unformed body. The Gollum became kind of a Jewish folklore figure in the Middle Ages for a kind of soulless slave that would serve its master but with great resentment. That's why Tolkien chose that name, the Gollum. That's someone who has this but this is completely enslaved, this is utterly obsessed, and this is lost. Get the ring, you can gain the whole world. That's Gollum. So what we're invited to is uh, to come to Jesus, who is the healer of souls, to find rest for our souls. And the way that we do that is to surrender each of our parts, to surrender our wills, to surrender our minds, to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, to love our neighbor as ourselves so that we can be once again integrated. It comes in the act and a life of surrender. My wife is a natural dancer. She's a California girl. She loves to dance. I grew up Baptist, Scandinavian, Swedish, in Rockford, Illinois. It was not a dancing family, but several years ago... We decided to take dancing lessons. We'd been married for 30 years, and so I thought it'd be okay. And we went to the <laughs> studio, and the guy was giving us lessons. And after a couple of lessons, the owner of the studio actually stopped us and said, there's a problem. And I knew there would be. I knew I'd be a problem because I'm just not good at that. But it turns out the problem was my wife. And he said to her, now, Mrs. Hortberg, if there's going to be a dance, someone must follow and someone must lead so Mrs. Ortberg, who is leading? And she said, under gritted teeth, he is. And then he said, and Mrs. Ortberg, who is following? And she said, under gritted teeth, I am. I didn't say a word. <laughs> but I enjoyed it immensely. <laughs> and... Uh, and that's the dance. At the core of the dance, the will was made to surrender to God. At the core of the dance, thy will be done, thy will be done, thy will be done. Starting in my body and my mind with our healer and physician, Jesus. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. You will find rest for your soul. So that's all I have to say about that. Um, Jim, why don't you come on up, and I think we're going to do a Q&A thing for a couple of minutes. And thank you very much. Yeah. Unfortunately, well, kind of fortunately, we have two little grandchildren now, so I fly tomorrow to be back with them in California. We're having a special time together. So I won't be here in the morning. Tomorrow, for God's sake, could someone give an award to Jim Smith for... <laughs> Uh, authorship that has just been transformational. Right before I left, my mom, I, I told you this, my mom said, Jim Smith, I love his books. My book club went through all of his books. They have changed people's lives. Tell him how much I love. So you could at least win the mom award. Yes! Um, yeah. yeah. I will take it, John.
<laughs> Let's start out with a fairly easy question. True or false, Daffy Duck has a soul. <laughs> false. False, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you started off with that, and it's true, there's so many images in our mind of what the soul is. But as you did tonight, which was really, thank you, because that was, I mean, for having sat under Dallas for so long, the computer analogy was hard. I've got parts mm -hmm. of it. Really, tonight, you made it the clearest I've had of that diagram. So thank you yeah. for that, which was, which was fascinating. Um, what's at stake in all of this? I mean, getting this right, because you've unpacked it, and I, I feel like I grasp it better than ever before. What is it that's at stake? Um, one of the ways that Dallas would talk about this is uh, that understanding is the basis of care. If I'm going to care for something, I, I'm not a car guy, so I'm not good with cars. I can't give a car very much care because I don't understand it very well. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't know that you have a soul or don't believe that you have a soul, you have a hard time caring well for your soul. So I think uh, to get clear on the fact that I have a will and I have a mind and I have a body and I have these relationships and then I can look and reflect on, are they in harmony with each other or are they not? I, I, I think I, I'd encourage everybody uh, at some point in the near future, just make a day right now to go be alone with yourself for a while and just ask, how is it with my soul? Mm -hmm. um, because we get so rushed, I think, more in our day than ever before. And our souls can be increasingly lost, and we don't know it. Right, right, yeah. I think also it has a lot to do with what should be the goal of Christian spiritual formation, which is yeah. Christ-likeness. Yeah. We've thought a lot about the disciplines. Um, we tend to put those first, like if I just do these disciplines, then I'll be Christ-like. That hasn't actually worked, <laughs> right? I mean, no. we, we haven't seen, and I remember you said one time in a talk that there was a guy that had been in, in one of your churches, one of your early churches, and I think he was like in his 60s, and you said- Really old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah what we are, right? Yeah. Men of a certain age. Uh, but you made that comment that having gone to church all yep. those years and he was still a really angry man. Do you remember yeah. that story? Yeah. And that has stayed with me that because I thought good that he was going to church yep. all those years, but a lack of transformation. So doing just the practice. But yeah, a lack of transformation. And then one of the dangers that often happens in faith communities, religious contexts of all kinds is the mistake of measuring spiritual maturity by devotional practices. Right. And we can never do that. If you did that back in Jesus' day and you measured spiritual maturity by devotional practices, who would come out on top? Mm -hmm. So we have to find a way to measure spiritual maturity so that the Pharisees don't win. Mm -hmm. And um, so if a practice helps you, that's great. Insofar as it's a practice, I'll, I'll ask folks sometimes, well, I'll ask here. If you're really honest, you won't see most of these people again. You don't care what they think. If you're really honest, how many of you do not like to journal? Raise your hand. Journal. Don't like to journal. Look at that. No wonder the world's going to hell. This is like the apprentice <laughs> gathering. There it is. Nobody likes to journal. Okay. This may be why you came. Uh, Jesus never journaled. Moses never journaled. Paul, Peter, Ruth, Esther, they grew to love God, to serve God, but they never went down to the stationery store and bought a little leather-bound book and wrote. So, so that, that issue of we have to make sure that when we think about transformation or spiritual maturity or whatever we want to call it, that we, we gauge it in terms of love, being immersed in love, mm -hmm. not in terms of devotional uh, practices or disciplines or something like that. Right, yeah. right, right. You know, when, when you went to see Dallas um, and he gave you the advice about learning how to arrange your days mm -hmm. so that you experience deep contentment, joy, and confidence in your everyday life with God, I remember you told me that um, you were like, oh, so I need to tell the other people in my church how to do <laughs> that. That's, that's what you, and you're like, no, you. So I, I guess a question, because I asked this to myself, what are the practices for you that help you develop deep contentment, joy, and confidence mm -hmm. in your everyday life? Mm -hmm. 
with you. It's not journaling, I don't think. It's not... You know, um, <laughs> particularly when I'm in pain, and these last couple of years have been real challenging for me and for my family, and so um, writing has been real helpful for me in that. Uh, I, I tend to worry and obsess a lot in these days, and a good thing about writing, if you have thoughts like that, is it keeps you from spiraling over and over and over again. Mm. So uh, in this season, it's been quite helpful to me. Um, for sure, having a friend, a fully disclosing friend where I have no secrets in front of him and I'm able to be together with him. Um, I have leaned a lot into community over these last couple of years. Uh, solitude, um, I, I, I never sleep through the night now. I, I mm. uh, am pretty much always awake and I had somebody say, just make sure you have a plan if you don't go back to sleep within 15 minutes. Mm. And so uh, if I don't, I will get up and um, uh, usually read at least a few pages of Henry Nouwen mm. because he writes about meeting with Jesus in a place of pain mm. in ways that are really helpful. So Nancy and I live in a little cabana mostly now, which is just one room, so there's no place to go. So I usually have a Talk of Dallas is queued up and put on earbuds and listen to that. If there's a space to go, then I'll read something. Um, so solitude... Uh, to have a sense of freedom that comes from that, that, that's been a real important one. Yeah, and that leads to the wellness of soul. All of this comes together, which is yeah. so good. I was particularly struck uh, when you talked about the self and the soul, that, yeah. that our modern construct is that we are a self. Yes. And your work really helped me as I was working through The Good and Beautiful You to see that distinction um, because uh, as several people when I was writing The Good and Beautiful You would say, oh, you're doing true self, false self. Uh, and I said... No, I'm doing soul, yeah. because it seems to me that's more fundamental. How did you come to that, for your, to see that? Because you talked about the difference between selfish and soulish, and that's an analogy I'm going to be stealing, because that's a good one. Yeah, it was um, uh, just, again, it took me about 10 years of trying to think about what it was that Dallas was saying, and then looking at Scripture, and then just living with that. And then when... Uh, when it got clearer to think about, well, why is there such difference when we talk about soul and when we talk about self? And I even find this will sound a little bit odd, but folks in psychology will talk about self-talk. I think to think in terms of soul talk, for me, is kind of a helpful thing. Mm -hmm. And again, we'll, we'll discuss self-talk. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. That is soul talk. But there's something about using soul language that communicates to the mind that there is a depth to existence. And to me, this is not just about psychological dynamics. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was also struck by, and I'd never heard that, that from the King James to the, the modern mm -hmm. translations, how that the word soul just gets dropped out. Yep. And that translators are making that decision along the way and, and choosing not to call it that, what it is, because maybe we don't get it. And I was thinking about how Dallas would talk about how um, so many of our translations, modern translations, don't talk about the heavens, the, you know, the, the plural of heaven. And we don't know what to do with it. So they, they like, well, it's air, or they get other things. Um, but as I think about that, if we understand the heavens, which is a key to understanding the gospel, mm -hmm. the, the, the kingdom is here, and then the soul, could it be that our our lack of understanding of these two fundamental things has left us in a place where we don't know what to do with these. No, that's really good, Jim. I, I, I think... Um, Could you say that again? What would you say? That's really good, Jim. Oh, I, I, I didn't hear. I couldn't, I couldn't hear. Worth the price of the conference. <laughs> I only wish my mother was here right now. Um, no, as you were saying that, uh, I think at the core of a lot of it is... Um, and this gets above my pay grade pretty quick, but it's that we have a hard time believing that the spiritual is real. Right. Yeah. And, you know, that's something, obviously, Dallas talked a lot about dualism, particularly in academic settings, has become kind of a dirty word. Hmm. And it implies this kind of platonic, you know, uh, the physical is bad, and none of us want to be guilty of that. Right. But I think it leaves us in a place where... Um, at an almost deeper than verbal letter level, you know, we think this is real, this is real. If I can touch it, taste it, feel it, then it's real. 
And if I can't, it's not really real. And so, you know, the Bible has that real fundamental distinction between what is visible and what is invisible. Um, therefore, we fix our eyes on not on what is visible, but what is invisible. For what is visible is temporal, but what is invisible, um, uh, the reality of the spiritual was just present to them. And I think most of us wrestle with it a lot. And I yeah. think you're right. I think that's part of why the heavens is a difficult concept, and that's part of why the soul is difficult. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of the spiritual that feels really real to us when we interact with it, mm -hmm. um, you said to me in one of our conversations, forgive this is, if this is a little too personal, but you've said in one of our conversations during this season that you've never felt uh, Dallas closer to you mm -hmm. in terms of that. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask then, how does that work for you? Yeah, uh, that actually is uh, a very holy thing and, and very personal. So parts of it I kind of guard. Yeah. But I think what I would say, again, Henry Nouwen has been helpful. Henry Nouwen would talk about there's a ministry of absence. Mm. And uh, I remember reading this one night. It was really helpful. You know, when Jesus says to his disciples, it's good for you that I leave. Mm. And I will send the Spirit. And so you're actually going to have an experience uh, of the Spirit and the indwelling presence of the Spirit. And therefore, in some ways, disciples, you're going to have an experience of Jesus with you that is deeper or different or has power to it in ways that they didn't when his body was there. Mm. And now and said he thinks it's somewhat the same way with people, that there is a kind of ministry by absence that can happen. And uh, I think, you know, for me, uh, one of the things that has been most helpful in my faith is that Dallas saw things the way that he did. Mm. And, you know, from the first time I was with him and we talked... It was just apparent to him, just God is here like this piano is apparent to me. Mm. And so uh, uh, I think to have a sense of um, the ministry of absence being present in my life in this season that obviously has been centered on God, um, but also my dad died about three years ago. I was reciting the 121st Psalm when he died. Uh, the last line, the Lord will watch over your life. He will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. Mm. And when I said those words, he breathed out and then he never breathed back in. Mm. And so I say that psalm pretty much every morning as I'm getting started. And uh, that sense of um, connection with my dad, the spiritual reality of my dad, and in many, many dark moments that with Dallas has been... Mm. Uh, uh, a great gift. Yeah, yeah. You know, after, you and I were honored to be pallbearers at Dallas's funeral, and um, and afterwards, when I went, Jane invited me to the house, and that that list of our our boys who are out there, you know, and and mm -hmm. I saw your name there and my name there, and I thought how glad it must have made him, and that's what Jane said, how glad he was that there were people who listened closely to what he was doing and we're continuing that work. So thank you, John, hmm. for doing that. Thank you for giving us that. And tonight, especially, let's give thanks to this brother, John.